السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My name is Maryam Al Khatib, and I want to welcome you to this next session on our road to a free Palestine. أخبروا عمرا أخبروا صلاحا أن القدس تنادي هل من ناصرا لي سرقوا ثوبي والآن يسرق عروبتي أخبروا عمرا وأخبروا صلاحا أن العرب انشغلوا بكره وأحقاد وحاربوا أنفسهم بسلاح وحاربوا الصهيون بالصياح أخبروا عمرا وأخبروا صلاحا بأن أرض القدس لن يؤذن فيها أذان الصباح القدس Jerusalem عاصمة فلسطين The capital of Palestine Feels so good to say that That is the topic of our session today A city that is so beloved to us So rich in its history So beautiful in its culture in its people, a city that holds our beloved Masjid Al-Aqsa, a city that's had to endure the ugliness of Israeli occupation and aggression, a city whose calls introduced to the world the words ethnic cleansing and settler colonialism, a city who's taught the world geography of Jerusalem, the neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, a city whose calls remind us that Palestinian resistance and resilience is alive and well. Al-Quds, Jerusalem, Asimat Palestine, the capital of Palestine. I'm excited for today's session and to have our speakers today tell us about Al-Quds and tell us about what's happening in Al-Quds and tell us about the policies that are being implemented and continued in furthering the settler colonial project that's eating up Al-Quds and impacting all of Palestine. Now our first speaker that many of you were expecting was Muhammad Al-Kurd. Now I hate to be the bearer of difficult news. I know. But he's serving a great cause. Muhammad al-Kurd has been summoned to address the United Nations. And unfortunately, in order for him to be able to prepare for that, he wasn't able last minute to be able to make it to be with us today. But let's give him a round of applause for all the work that he's been doing. For those who don't know, Muhammad al-Kurd is a full-time student and he's been all over the world, all over the US, um, doing these talks, doing a book tour. So he's a busy man and we thank him for everything that he's done. Now to the good news. Someone very, very special has offered to step in for Muhammad al-Kurd. Someone who many of you, including myself, followed on Instagram. Someone who made us cry and made us laugh. Someone who was live streaming day in and day out from Sheikh Jarrah, who made us feel like we were sitting there that we were experiencing it ourselves. Someone who we held our breath when she was arrested. And we celebrated with her when she graduated. Someone who inspires us, who humanized Sheikh Jarrah for us, who humanized the cause of Palestine for the world, who captivated us, who felt like our little sister, who was gonna help us free Palestine. The second half of the dynamic duo and the Al-Kurd siblings, I am so excited to introduce and to announce that Muna Al-Kurd <laughs> is joining us live from Sheikh Jarrah, from the heart of Jerusalem, from the heart of the place we've fallen in love with, from the beloved Palestine. Welcome, Muna Al-Kurd. And before Muna, before you hand it over to Muna, Muna, I just want to, I wish you could feel the energy and excitement in the room for you. We have so much love for you, so much appreciation for you 
and the families of Sheikh Jarrah and the families of Jerusalem and all of Palestine for continuing to inspire us, for continuing to stand for us, to stand for the cause, to protect our beloved land and to continue to inspire us and work and dream and believe that we will return and that we will be returning soon. And with that, I'll hand it over to Muna. Faddali. Assalamu alaikum. ويسعد مساكم جميعا من القدس عاصمة فلسطين الأبدية وتحديدا حي الشيخ جراح الصامد بشكركم على الاستضافة وبشكركم على هذا المؤتمر مش هطول عليكم كثير فبدي أبدلش معكم مع قصة الحي بتخيل أغلبكم سمع عن قضية حي الشيخ جراح في السوشيال ميديا في الآونة الأخيرة لكن مهم تعرفوا أنه حي الشيخ جراح صامد ومقاوم ومناضل منذ عشرات السنين قضية حي الشيخ جراح في محاكم الاحتلال الاستعمارية من قرابة الخمسين عام Recording in progress. ومن المهم جدا أنكم تكونوا عارفين أنه أهالي الحي بناضلوا وبقاتلوا من كل هاي السنين على مدار كل هاي السنوات وبالتالي القصة اللي سمعتوها حديثا هي ليست قصة جديدة بل قصة توارثناها عن أجدادنا وآبائنا وما زلنا نقاوم حتى إن شاء الله نحقق مطالبنا قصة الحي باختصار هي أنه 28 عائلة لاجئة هجرت بال48 من مناطق مختلفة من فلسطين التاريخية بعد الاحتلال الإسرائيلي على أراضي فلسطين وسكنوا بقعة في حي الشيخ جراح في مدينة القدس بناء على اتفاقية بين الحكومة الأردنية والأونر وسكنوا هذا المكان عاشوا فيه وكان من المفترض بعد ثلاث سنوات من سكنهم أن يتم تسجيل الأراضي هذه بأسمائهم لكن للأسف الحكومة الأردنية لم تسجل الأراضي بأسمائهم وحصلت حرب السبعة وستين لم يبقى وجود للأردن في المنطقة وبالتالي للأسف الشديد لم نحصل على أوراق ملكية حتى الآن وأنا خلوني اليوم عبر هذه المنصة أدعو وأوجه رسالة للحكومة الأردنية أن تقوم بالإفاء بوعدها وإيصال أوراق الملكية اللازمة لنا لحتى نقدر نبقى في منازلنا وأراضينا في حي الشيخ جراح كثير بحب أحكي عن دور الجاليات في الخارج خاصة الجالية الفلسطينية يعني كثير كنت أسمع ناس بتقول لي وبتبعت لي رسائل على السوشيال ميديا بتقول لي يا منى احنا مش عارفين شو نعمل لانه احنا مش قادرين نكون قراب معكم ولا قادرين نقاتل معكم في الميدان ونناضل يعني ونقاوم معكم في الميدان وبالتالي احنا ما في بايدنا نعمل شيء بالعكس يعني انا بالنسبه لي كل فلسطيني في الخارج هو سفير للقضيه وواجب عليه بالنسبه لي يمكن اكثر من الفلسطيني داخل فلسطين أن يقوم بدوره ومسؤوليته تجاه القضية بنشرها الحديث عنها دعمها بكل ما يملك وبكل ما يستطيع لحتى أهله وأحبابه في فلسطين يقدروا يستمروا أنتم كجالية فلسطينية خارج فلسطين تقدروا يمكن أكثر منا لأنه قد ما كان عندكم مساحة من الحرية أكبر من المساحة المعطاة لنا لأنه بالنهاية إحنا كفلسطينيين داخل فلسطيني داخل فلسطين يعني الاحتلال ماسكنا من أعناقنا إذا تحدثنا بغلق أحياءنا إذا تحدثنا بسرق منازلنا إذا تحدثنا بقوم باعتقالنا لحتى يكمم أفواهنا وبالتالي إحنا معرضين لخطر دائم طوال الوقت لذلك إحنا بحاجتكم كفلسطينيين وغير فلسطينيين خارج فلسطين لحتى تساندونا لأنه بالنهاية هاي مش قضية فلسطين والفلسطينيين وحدهم هاي قضية كل بني آدم عنده إنسانية وبالتالي يا جماعة مهم جدا العمل الجماعي لأنه بدون العمل الجماعي الشعوب ما بتتحرر والبلدان لا تحرر بالتالي العمل الجماعي مهم جدا العمل الجماعي اللي على السوشيال ميديا وأثبتت السوشيال ميديا في الآونة الماضية قد إيه لها دور مهم وفاعل بالفعل بأنه تحرك شعوب وتحرك حكومات لحتى يعملوا مواقف ويأثروا وبالتالي السوشيال ميديا مهمة جدا أنا دائما بقول وبرجع بحكي كل بوست بفرق كل تويتة بتفرق لذلك تحدثوا عن القضية على السوشيال ميديا السوشيال ميديا 
كانت بالفعل اداه لحتى توصل صوتنا للعالم بس ما تنسوا انه انا انا باعتبار انا بعتبر السوشيال ميديا خاصه فيسبوك انستغرام اداه من ادوات الاحتلال اللي وضعين تقييدات وانتهاكات علينا كفلسطينيين وبحاربوا المحتوى الفلسطيني بطريقة يعني قذرة جدا شفتوا بالآونة الماضية كيف حجبوا بعض الصفحات الفلسطينية التي تتحدث عن مدينة القدس لأنها تغطي إحداث مدينة القدس والانتهاكات الإسرائيلية في المدينة وفي كل فلسطين وبالتالي حتى السوشيال ميديا تحاربنا وبالتالي دوركم مهم على السوشيال ميديا أنا دائماً بقول كما نحارب في الميدان نحن كفلسطينيين أنتم تحاربون أيضاً على السوشيال ميديا فمن المهم أن تستمروا على السوشيال ميديا يا جماعة على الهاشتاجات مع كل القضايا العادلة في كل فلسطين وليس فقط في الشيخ جراح في سلوان وفي لفتة في بيتا وفي كل منطقة فلسطينية معرضة لانتهاكات الاحتلال وأيضاً من المهم جداً كمان إنكم تستمروا في حراككم على الأرض أنتم صح مش قادرين تيجوا عنا على فلسطين إن شاء الله تدخلوها وهي محررة قريبا بإذن الله تعالى لكن أيضا حراككم على الأرض أيضا حراككم على الأرض مهم يعني أنتم مش قادرين توصلونا لكن أنتم بتقدروا تعملوا وقفات احتجاجية ومظاهرات في أماكن تواجدكم فما تقصروا يعني أنا بالنسبة إلي يعني السوشيال ميديا هي أضعف الإيمان لكن أن تقوم بالفعل هو الواجب عليك وبالتالي أي فعل مهما كان صغير ممكن بالفعل يحدث تأثير بتوقف في نص الشارع تحمل علم فلسطين أو تحمل لافتة مكتوب عليها سيف شيخ جراح أو, أو لن نرحل أو أي شيء متعلق بكل القضية الفلسطينية هذا واجب على كل حدا في أماكن تواجده وقفوا أمام السفارة الأمريكية وقفوا أمام مش عارفة إيش أي مكان اللي عن جد ممكن تأثروا فيه وتوصلوا صوتنا فيه شغلة مهمة يمكن أغلبكم بسأل عنها وهي الوضع الحالي في حي الشيخ جراح في حي الشيخ جراح صراحة حالياً الوضع ممكن أقول عنه هادئ لكن هو هادئ هذا الهدوء ما قبل العاصفة يعني مهم يا جماعة تعرفوا أنه نحن كفلسطينيين نعي تماماً أننا نتعامل مع نظام استعماري استيطاني فاشي إحلالي صهيوني غاصب اللي بيحاول يطهرنا عرقيا ويهجرنا قصريا وبالتالي محاكم هذا الاحتلال هي قائمة وخلقت ووجدت لحتى تخدم الاستيطان والمستوطنين وليس لتخدمنا نحن كفلسطينيين وبالتالي إحنا آخر إشي صار في حي الشيخ جراح هو أن محكمة الاحتلال قدمت مقترح في ظاهره ببين أنه مقترح فيه ممكن إنجاز لكن في باطنه هو اعتراف في ملكية المستوطنين للأرض والحمد لله كما عاهدتمونا دائما رفضنا هذا المقترح لأنه إحنا نرفض أن نتخلى عن شبر واحد من أراضينا في حي الشيخ جراح في القدس وفي كل فلسطين بالتالي رفضنا هذا المقترح لكن نحن نعي تماما أن رفضنا لهذا المقترح يعني وضعنا في دائرة الخطر كنا مخيرين بين السيء والأسوأ ونحن اخترنا الأسوأ لأنه إحنا نختار كرامتنا ومنازلنا وأرضنا فوق كل شيء وبالتالي هذا, هذا الهدوء ما قبل العاصفة هو هدوء بخيفنا لأنه نعرف شو هذا النظام الاستعماري اللي مستحيل يتخذ قرار لصالحنا لكن أنا دائما بقول وبرجع بقول نحن نؤمن تماما بالحراك الشعبي وبالشعب وبالناس في كل أماكن تواجدهم وبالتالي أنا أؤمن فيكم أنتم اللي تضغطوا على حكوماتكم أينما كنتم لضغط للضغط على حكومة الاحتلال لوقف جرائم حربها وبالتالي دوركم يا جماعة مهم دوركم يحدث فارق وتأثير ما تنسوا زي ما قلت لكم أنه أنتم عندكم مساحة أكبر من الحرية وعمل الفعاليات أكثر منا بفلسطين لذلك إحنا دائما بحاجة لدعمكم يا جماعة في كل القضايا قضية الأسرة أيضا المضربين عن الطعام اللي الحمد لله بعضهم انتزعوا حريتهم وانتزعوا قرارات بوقف الحكم الإداري بحقهم الحمد لله رب العالمين لكن ما ننسى إنه مش بس هدول في لسه أسرة مضربين عن الطعام بحاجة دعمنا وبحاجة مناصرتنا لإلهم أيضا حتى الأسرة الغير مضربين كل شخص فلسطيني بحاجة دعمكم داخل فلسطين من أسرة من مبعدين من معتقلين 
لذلك يا جماعة ما تقصروا في حق أي حدا ولا حق أي قضية كل قضية بحاجتكم المهم يا جماعة أحكي لكم إنه هذا العمل تراكمي إحنا ما جينا حكينا إنه إحنا إحنا عملنا كل شيء بس بالأشهر الماضية ست عملت وجارتي عملت وأبوي عمل وجاري عمل وإمي عملت وبنت جيراني عملت وبالتالي إحنا عمالنا بنكمل وقبل ستة في أجيال وأجيال من الفلسطينيين اللي ناضلوا وقاوموا وقاتلوا واستشهدوا وسجنوا وفي ما زالوا في الأسر لحتى إحنا نعيش بكرامة فهذا العمل تراكمي ومستمر وسيبقى مستمر طالما في نفس فينا لأنه بالنهاية ما في واحد بتنازل عن أرضه وبيته أنتوا بتت... أنتوا بعرفش إذا الكل فلسطيني هون ممكن غير فلسطيني بس زي ما قلت هي قضية إنسانية سياسية بالتالي أي أي حدا ممكن يشعر فيها إنه بني آدم يكون قاعد في بيته فجأة يلاقي مستوطن غريب محتل غاصب يطلعه من البيت ويقول هذا البيت مش إلك هذا البيت إلي بدون أي وجه حق وبدون أي شكل قانوني حتى المستوطنين الذين يدعون ملكيتهم لأراضي حي الشيخ جراح هم لا يملكون حتى أوراق ملكية بالتالي مهم يا جماعة نخلي هذا العمل الجماعي وهذا هذا النضال الجماعي مستمر خلينا نستمر لأنه دائما التعويل على الاستمرارية الاحتلال للأسف من سياساته اللي يعني نعيها تماما هي المماطلة المماطلة لحتى الناس تنسى الناس تهدى الناس تتعب لكن إحنا دائما بنقول إذا الاحتلال نفسه طويل إحنا نفسنا أطول ولازم نكمل إحنا بنوعدكم كأهالي حي الشيخ جراح كأهالي القدس عاصمة فلسطين إنه نكمل لكن إحنا بحاجتكم لحتى نفسنا يقوى فيكم ما بنقدر نكمل لحالنا لأنه القضية ليست قانونية القضية سياسية بحتة وبالتالي هي بحاجة ضغط سياسي بالقانون كل القوانين وضعت لخدمة الاستيطان والمستوطنين المستوطنين اللي بيدعوا الملكية ما معهم أوراق ملكية وبالتالي كمحكمة قانونية فهي خاسرة لأنه أول على آخر كله موجود كل هذا النظام الاستعماري موجود لخدمتهم كصهاينة إسرائيليين يهود وليس لخدمتي أنا كفلسطينية وبالتالي الضغط السياسي هو الذي يحدث فارق الضغط السياسي في الميدان والضغط السياسي على السوشيال ميديا أنا بديش أطول عليكم أكثر ما شاء الله عنكم يعني واضح أنه المؤتمر أكيد رح يكون يعني ثري جداً بالمتحدثين رح يكونوا موجودين فيه يعطيكم ألف عافية وموفقين وإن شاء الله إن شاء الله يعني دائما بنسمع منكم عن مبادراتكم وعن فعالياتكم عن نشاطاتكم وعن وقفاتكم الاحتجاجية والمظاهرات لأنه we need action مش بس tweets مهمة لتويتس مهمة لبوستس بس الاكشن هو اللي بيحدث تغيير وفارق يعطيكم ألف عافية تصبحون على خير بتوقيتي وإن شاء الله نهاركم سعيد وشكرا لكم جميعا الله يعافيكي يا منى ويقويكي ويقدركم على هالمهمة ويقدرنا and to allow us to continue uh, this mission and support one thing I want to emphasize is what Muna said Muna is not just thanking us she's asking us She's demanding from us that we continue this work, that social media is important. It's important to continue this social media, but action is needed. Like she said, we need action. And we have here rights that they don't have. We have opportunities that they don't have. They're fighting their own fight. And we have to fight the fight here. We have to ensure that our government is not enabling the occupation of our own land. And one other thing that uh, Muna uh, emphasized on is the situation in Sheikh Jarrah. She said, right now it's really quiet. And they feel like it's the quiet before the storm. And that when it's quiet and when you're dealing with a fascist apartheid state like the state of Israel, that makes them nervous. But this is also part of their strategy, to let things die down, to let people forget, let people cool down. But she's making a promise that they're not going to stop fighting. And so she's asking us also to not, keep fight, not to stop fighting. And so let's keep that in mind, inshallah, to keep the fight going, to keep carrying this cause forward here until we can join Muna and everybody else and the families of Sheikh Jarrah in a free Palestine, inshallah. <laughs> to tell us more about the situation in Al-Quds in Jerusalem, 
I'm going to invite our next speaker uh, to the stage. Uh, Khalid Turani is a Palestinian American advocate for the rights of the people of Palestine. He is currently the chairman of Refugee Aid Initiative, a charity that focuses on helping refugees and victims of conflict and disasters. I got the opportunity to listen to uh, Brother Khaled yesterday and it really kind of shook me to my core what he was saying about what's happening in Jerusalem and Quds. And I think it's really, really important um, to really understand the policies and what's happening in Quds because um, what's happening in Quds affects everything that's happening in Palestine. So please help me welcoming uh, Khaled Turani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I need to follow in the footstep of Mun al Kurd is an amazing feat, and then to be preceded by literal and virtual giants like Omar Suleiman. Amazing khutbah, one of the best that I've heard in a long time. Salt, Ek Ahsan. يا زلمة أنا معروف إني صوتي عالي طيب يعني uh, it is really an honor for me to to share the same stage with عمر سليمان uh, hip and cool شيخ who's well grounded in Islamic scholarship yet never waffles in the issue of فلسطين never plays to the powers and to what is acceptable. And also to share the stage with uh, Fahad Abu Aqil, who is, has been for many years a positive force in, that took the Presbyterian Church to the next level in support of the BDS, one of the first churches in the United States to really be very strong in in boycotting the apartheid regime, the colonialist entity of Israel is the Presbyterian Church. So really give him a big hand of, of applause. Yes, Sheikh Omar Suleiman spoke, spoke about being inconvenienced in your, for your faith. And they were inconvenienced in their faith by taking these steps. Not only did they divest from any investment in the occupation in Palestine, but they also divest from companies that supports the occupation like, uh, Halibur, like uh, uh, Caterpillar and, and Motorola and HP and, and others. Fahad Abu Aqil is, is where I'm going to talk about Jerusalem. He's a Palestinian, he's a Palestinian Christian. So we are, while we, while we, hide, we might have our differences when it comes to, to faith, but we're bounded by our common struggle for justice, our common struggle for our identity, for our narrative, for our humanity, for our faith, because the Israeli occupation does not really distinguish, does not discriminate against you if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim. They will oppress you equally. They are equal opportunity oppressor. So we are united. What we have in common with Fahid Abu Akhil and our brothers and sisters in the struggle for the freedom of Palestine and Jerusalem is a whole lot more than what Fahid Abu Akhil has in common with another Christian who is supporter of the Israeli occupation. So we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Palestine, regardless of their faith, their creed, or political persuasion. Because the struggle for Palestine can be all compartmentalized in the struggle for Jerusalem. And I want to take you with two hadith by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One is just kind of, and I always wanted to have that imagery of the Prophet ﷺ putting his noble hand on the shoulder of Mu'ad ibn Jabal walking the dusty roads of Al-Madinah and telling him, Ya Mu'ad, 
سيفتح الله عليكم الشام من بعد من العريش إلى الفرات رجالهم ونساؤهم وإماؤهم في رباط إلى يوم القيامة فمن نزل منكم بساحل من سواحل الشام أو بأرض أو ببيت المقدس فهو في جهاد إلى يوم القيامة أو معاذ الله is going to allow you to conquer the Levant from the borders of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates the man, the woman and even the servants are in a state of guardianship until the day of judgment all those who reside on the shores of Palestine or the Levant and those who reside in Jerusalem are in a state of struggle until the day of judgment so Mun al-Kurd and our brothers and sisters in Palestine just by waking up breathing the air and drinking the water they are in a state of struggle until the day of judgment because that is the designation by the Prophet the other hadith which is more relevant to you and I and that is the hadith by Maymuna when Maymuna went to the Prophet and she asked an open-ended question amazing question she said Ya Rasulullah, aftina fi Bayt al-Maqdis. Tell us about Jerusalem. The Prophet can have a hundred thousand different answers. He could have said, it's over there. <laughs> but the Prophet didn't say that. The Prophet وسلم, said, Go and pray in it. And then Maymuna proceeded to ask, what if I can't? How many of you cannot go and pray in Jerusalem today? Most of you can, I guess. <laughs> but you know about the struggle of going to Palestine and trying to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque. So the Prophet Sallallahu says to Maymuna, go and pray in it. And she said, what if I can't? And the Prophet Sallallahu gives her the answer. But he didn't give the answer only to Maymuna. He gave the answer to you and I. He gave the answer to all of us. He said, Take some oil to be brought to Jerusalem, to be placed in the lanterns. What does that mean, really? What does it mean? Just, you know, got to think about it. It got me scratching my head. What does it mean to... It means keep the light on in Jerusalem. It means keep the light on in Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Imagine if they turn the light off in this hall, what are you going to do? Maybe you'll sit for two minutes, maybe three minutes, and then you start walking out. And the Prophet said basically his message to all of us make sure that the light will never be turned off in Al Masjid Al Aqsa. That the light will never be turned off in Jerusalem. Be inconvenienced for your faith. Be inconvenienced for your principles. Be inconvenienced for the sake of our people in Jerusalem, like Sheikh Omar was, was saying in Khutbat al Jum'a. A great message that we must be inconvenienced. أم حسبتم أن تدخلوا الجنة ولما يأتكم مثل الذين خلوا من قبلكم مستهم البأساء والضراء وزلزلوا حتى يقول الرسول والذين آمنوا معه متى نصر الله ألا إن نصر الله قريب الله tells us a clear message in the Quran do you think that you're going to attain a presence in heaven without receiving the example of those who, those who preceded you. They were touched by adversity. And the earth would shake underneath them. That the believers and even the prophet would cry out to Allah, Oh Allah, when is victory? And the answer comes from Allah, very clear. Victory is near. I believe victory is near with you and I being inconvenienced for the sake of our faith, for the sake of our beloved Jerusalem. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Jazakallah khair, Brother Khalid. Up next, we have Reverend Fahed Abu Aqil, who uh, Brother Khalid um, started introducing. Uh, Reverend Fahed Abu Aqil is a Palestinian American Presbyterian minister. He's orig originally from Galilee, but all lives in Atlanta, Georgia. He was in the past a moderator of the Presbyterian Church, and he's currently the president of the Friends of the Palestinian Medical Society. He also serves as a board member of the Palestinian Alliance for Peace. Please help me welcome Reverend Fahed Abu Aqid. You know, you are a wise woman that you took uh, Khalid before me because I did not want to go after Muna, let's face it. So when she took Khalid before me, I feel so relieved. So Muna already gave us the marching orders. She really said, we as youth, young adult, older adults, doctors, lawyer, and every business under the sun as right now Palestinian Americans, our job is very clear. To advocate for justice for Palestine and end the brutal Israeli military occupation. She is very clear, and let's face it, I want to say yesterday, Khalid told us, let's face it, after 70, we continue kicking, but we don't have any imagination, huh? He said, you, the children, the young people, the young adult have the dreams. And let's confess what he said to us. He said, literally, everybody, in the PLO is 70 to 110, huh? God forgive them, but you are the future of Palestine here. And let's face it, it is Mona, her brother, the young women and men in Sheikh Jarrah, Silwan, Jerusalem, and Gaza that united us in a way we never experienced before. So I better stick because uh, she is very you know, focus on 15 minutes. Uh, growing up in the village called Kufr Yasif, next to Akka, or 25 miles northwest of Nazareth, in the Galilee area, first, I want to share with you my Nakba experience. In 1948, I was a four-year-old kid. And the only thing I remember, going with my father, five sisters, and two brothers, <laughs> leaving our home. And as a four-year-old kid, you are close to who? Mother, than anybody else. So I can see myself running around my dad five sisters and two brothers looking for my mother and she was not there and suddenly i looked up and she was on the top of the roof waving her hand you know you say to americans your mother is on the top of the roof they laugh well face it all of our roofs are flat and my dad took us to the east to the mountain to the druze village called yirka and we were put in a makeshift Palestinian refugee camp. Let's, it's not a refugee camp. It's like scouts tent, nothing, huh? And we were there for almost uh, uh, three uh, months. And it was my older sister, Maryam, that took care of us. So when we came back, five Palestinian villages were destroyed to the ground. And one of those villages was Al Birwa. That's where Mahmoud Darwish was born and came to Jdaidi. And every day he will walk to come to our high school in Kufri Yasif. So he was a graduate. The poet of Palestine was a graduate in our village, Kufri Yasif. Growing up, this experience haunted me, and I always wanted to ask my mother, why you did not go with us? 
And I discovered that my mother was very strong. And she said to dad, you take the children. You can protect them. This is our home. This is our land. And this is our church. If the Zionists want to kill me, they need to kill me in my home. So as I look at my experience, I learned the importance and the power of resistance from my mother. So today, <laughs> so, they, so today, all of us want to salute our mothers, our grandmothers, our spouses, our sisters, our daughters. Please remember that you are the backbone of our resistance, our steadfastness, yes, our smooth. We salute you, we honor you, and thank you for your partnership to free Palestine and all Palestinians. So the new settler colonial state policy for the 150,000 Palestinians who remained in Palestine was to have a policy to continue to steal our land and control our movement. So from 1948 until 1966, listen to that, when I came to study in the United States of America, any time I wanted to leave Kufr Yassif, I needed to go to the Israeli military governor. I needed a permit from the Israeli military governor. And if I'm found in any place without a permit, I go to court and I go to jail. So when I came to the United States in January 1966, January the 29th, 1966, to Lakeland, Florida. And in November 1966, my roommate wanted to take me to Detroit, Michigan. So, you know, you continue living where you came from. So I took my passport, all my student papers and everything, and I said, Rubel, are you going to take me to the military governor to get a permit? He said, what are you talking about? I said, I need a permit to travel. He said, this is America. You can go anywhere without a permit. Forget about Israel. So we left Florida. He said, this is Georgia. We left Georgia. This is Tennessee. So as I remember my first Thanksgiving experience, it was the most liberating experience of my life. Good old American don't know that a person who's a Palestinian Christian in, listen to that, in Bethlehem, the relative of Jonathan Kutab and an American passport cannot come six miles to Jerusalem without a permit unless we begin to tell our story. Our story is dead. So that's very important. So, yeah. So let's come back to Palestine and Jerusalem. Israel is still have the same old settler colonial policy. They want the land without the people. But thank God for the Palestinians in Galilee and in Mutallat, we were only 150,000 people in 1948. Today, we are more than 2 million Palestinians. <laughs> huh? And in, in Gaza, there are at least 2 million Palestinians. And in the West Bank, 3 million. So we are right now more than 7 million Palestinians. Huh? We are more than 50% of the population from the river to the sea, huh? No, we're not talking about outside Palestine. So they need to understand their settler colonial project is failing and will continue failing, huh? 
So when they destroyed in 1948, 530 villages and towns and exiled more than a million Palestinians and continued to steal the land and they continue to do the same thing now. And that's where we needed to say to the, our sisters and brothers, whatever happened to us from 48 to 1967, now they continue to do the same thing in East Jerusalem, West, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in East Jerusalem, West Bank, and all over uh, Palestine. And that means we really need to understand especially a MP and we the US citizen that we are going to continue to communicate our story our narrative and our suffering under a brutal military occupation remember we have suppose 10% with us 10% against us but let's face it you and I need to put our eyes on the 80% in the middle. They don't know the right from the left. And they never heard your story, and they never heard my story. How to explain that a Palestinian people under occupation need a permit to go to the hospital, go to the university, go to cultivate their own land. We need to really confess that Sheikh Jarrah, Silwan and Jerusalem and Gaza united us this last spring in a way we never experienced. We experienced the Palestinian in Galilee, the Palestinian in Mutallat, the Palestinian in Gaza, in all Palestine, in all the Arab world, in, in North America, all over. We became one unity with one goal. We must oppose the Israeli military occupation and their brutal power over our lives as Palestinians. <laughs> now, as we focus on Jerusalem Al-Quds, it is a holy city to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. What Israel policy is doing is to Judaize Jerusalem trying to tell the world that it is their eternal capital of Israel and that exclusive policy is a policy of death and destruction, saying to 2.5 billion Christians of the world, forget about Jerusalem, to tell close to 2 billion Muslims of the world, forget about Jerusalem, their policy is bankrupt and their idea is bankrupt from a historical point of view and from, their, from our religious point of view, from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. It's a bankrupt uh, idea. What can we do? First, pray for our Palestinian people under the brutal occupation. Second, you know, prayer does not enough. We need to put some hands and legs and little brain over our prayer. And that means Imagine, in East Jerusalem, because of the occupation and COVID, 50% of our Palestinian shops are closed. Huh? That's a crisis. What we need to put our energy on, the Palestinians who still have business, how do we support them? How to let them continue to work and sell and tell them and tell the world that Al-Quds is our religious center, Al-Quds is our political center, Al-Quds is our economic center. And what Israel is doing every day is to strangle the city and cut the Palestinian relationship with the city and they will never succeed. They stop us to go to the Aqsa to pray you know this is just uh, 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 when the Imam wanted to pray uh, the Coptic went to the, uh, uh, to the Holy Sepulchre and start doing the dance. We are one people. <laughs> so 
so finally, when President Trump, who did not know right from left, moved the embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to Jerusalem, I was interviewed on, on television. I said, I, I want to ask the president, what Jerusalem is he talking about? Is he talking about the Jerusalem inside the old city with that gold dome? Or is he talking about East Jerusalem? Is he talking about West Jerusalem? Or is he talking about greater Jerusalem that the Israeli Knesset already had in law that in the edge on the north goes what? <laughs> to Ramallah. In the edge of the greater Jerusalem goes all the way in the south to Bethlehem. In the east, over the mountains, you see Jericho. What is what Jerusalem is talking about? She said, what do you mean? I said, I need to understand the president of the United States. What Jerusalem is he talking about? So we need to know that our audience in the U.S. don't know their right from their left when we're talking about uh, uh, Jerusalem. So that's uh, very important as we think about the city of Jerusalem, that we both, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims, Jerusalem is in our heart. So as I think about AM, AMP uh, and dealing with our uh, problems in the U.S., imagine two weeks ago uh, or two months ago what they did. Listen what they did. They trained us Monday and Tuesday. How to talk on two, three, four issues with our Congress people and our senators. And we were more than 700 people from 50 states. Listen to me. I've been in the United States for 55 years. No organization did what A and B did. <laughs> Not at all. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we talked with Congress people and the senators in a way that I never dreamed before. That means AMP discovered our American secret reality, political reality. And our political reality has to do with a vote and a dollar and your advocacy. And if you don't do that, we are dead. So that means we need to rise up with AMP, support them, and work in every state, in every district, in every election under the sun. We, the Palestinian American, and our, our advocates, we need to work in, with AMP in a way we never dreamed before. If we are 2,000 here, imagine when we go home, each one of us will have uh, 10 people, that's 20,000. The 20,000 becomes 40,000. The 40, I mean, the United States is loaded with power of communication, and we can communicate to our churches, to our mosque, to our American people. That's the focus we need to look at. It's a great to be here, and I'm grateful to a man by the name of Imad Sabah that linked me with AMP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend and Ammo Fahed. Just like you instructed us to cherish those in our life, we cherish you and your wisdom and your experience that you shared with us. And we will work to see a free Palestine soon, inshallah. Next, we have Enes Yalman. He is a Turkish activist and supporter of Palestine and Palestinian rights. In the recent war on Gaza and the attacks on Al-Aqsa and Sheikh Jarrah, he was a prominent voice on social media covering the events for the Turkish people. Anis is also the Secretary General of the International Islamic Federation of Student Organizations. He is active with a number of international organizations, think tanks, media networks, and newspapers focused on regional politics and international relations, youth policy, and leadership. He currently serves as the Director of the International Office at Ibn Khaldun University in Turkey. Please help me welcoming, in brother, welcoming brother Anis. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I'm going to repeat each and every time I'm going to come on this stage during the conference. I'm honored 
and privileged to be part of this wonderful family, AMP. And I'm thanking the organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing conference. <clears throat> In fact, um, I want to convey, convey a message of hundreds of brothers and sisters all the way from Turkey who sends their best regards for Palestinians in America and through them to all uh, Palestinians all around the world that Turkey with people and officials was and it is and it will be uh, supporting Palestinians and um, the cause of uh, Palestine. Um, second of all, I want to, again, to congratulate AMP for, for, for this wonderful job uh, that they do. I think uh, uh, Ammo uh, Abu Aqil already mentioned everything that can be said. But I don't think only Americans, Palestinians should support the AMP. I think all Palestinians and uh, Muslims and humans all around the world should be hand in hand with the AMP and with other organizations uh, to contribute to the cause uh, of uh, Palestine. And I'm very amazed, which is AMP should be a, an example for other countries in the way how do they do the conferences is not because of the wonderful participants, is not for the young people that are here, but for the children. Those are four and five years old that they're gonna carry that cause and they are our leaders of futures. And I think this is one of other best examples we should all follow all around the world. Now, um, much said about Palestine and I think we're doing good. Palestinians and Palestinian cause is uh, in the best situation ever because every truth and reality is exposed and how the Israelis doing and each and everyone will know now about Hay Sheikh Jarrah, Hay Salwan, Beita, Na'alain al-Majd, Jabal Sabah, Al-Quds, Mahallat Al-Quds, Bab Al-Silsila, Bab Al-Amud, everything now is very clear to each and everyone but we should continue, each and every one of us should continue from their own positions on social media, activists and uh, governments, uh, you know, human rights institutions and so on. So we need to continue on that. And also, um, I, um, I will not take longer since my time is almost going to end saying that um, I was believing the Palestine will be free. And this conference and those amazing speakers gave us more hope and believe that Palestine will be free. And that path is clear. So, so it's on us whether we're gonna be part of that wonderful opportunity to be part of that process to be remembered as we were part of the process of uh, free Palestine, inshallah. I am the one, one of the, um, I don't want to end it with uh, 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 emotions. I think it's very hard uh, since the active work that we do uh, about Palestine that we will, I will, it will be hard for me to go and visit and see and witness and pray in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, although I know each and every street now because of the, uh, you know, live sessions that we were doing. But the only choice for us is now is free Palestine. So inshallah, that we, we, our age will be ready in, uh, to, to go there. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Anas. I'm also currently banned from uh, entering Palestine, so I can't pray Masjid Al-Aqsa, and I was like, Israel is kind of silly, right? Because by banning me, like, I literally have only one solution, and that is to work towards a free Palestine, inshallah. <laughs> Our final speaker for this session needs no introduction. In fact, if I start reading his bio, he'll probably just tower over me until I finish it. 
So I'm going to introduce him in the same way I introduced him last time I got the honor to introduce Dr. Umar Suleiman. And that's by encouraging everyone to look up his series, 40 Hadith on Social Justice. This series honestly changed my life. When I was a student activist in college, you know, I did the activism, but I always felt like, you know, faith was here, activism was here. And then when I listened to the series and I began to absorb what Islam says about justice, wallahi put me to shame. Because no one, nothing, asks or demands of justice more than Islam. Islam demands justice more than any social justice organization, more than any social justice individual. And it becomes a source of pride for our work and a source of motivation. So I encourage you all to look up that series and listen to it, inshallah. It's as good as the khutbah uh, that we heard um, today, which was incredible. And with that, please help me welcoming Dr. Omar Sulaiman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, MashaAllah, it's been a long time since I've felt the energy uh, that I feel in this room. So I know that everyone has spoken about how inspirational uh, Sister Muna Kurd is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her. She's one of my heroes. May Allah reward her and elevate her and protect her family. And listening to the speakers that followed, um, unbelievable. And frankly, uh, Maryam, mashallah, um, this was, every time I'm listening to you speak from the heart, uh, what an inspiration that you are. So may Allah bless you for keeping it going, alhamdulillah, the way that you have been keeping it going. And preserve you and protect you and elevate you and all of those young people that have taken this cause to heart, that have moved away from performance and instead merged perfectly their prayer and their activism through efforts like American Muslims for Palestine. I'm gonna share with you all um, something personal uh, and it was only because I've been listening to the personal so I wasn't planning to share much of the personal. To be quite frank with you, I, I didn't really know what I was going to say or be able to contribute to a panel like this on this specific subject. Uh, SubhanAllah, I recently was digging into my family history, which is a very Palestinian thing to do, right? You dig into your family history, you start to find every story and you cling to it. And you take something from it. And so, those of you that listened to a lecture I gave about my mom, rahmatullahi alayha, um, I want to say I gave this lecture nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago at this point. Um, she passed away in 2007, may Allah have mercy on her. It took me a long time uh, to give that lecture. Uh, people are like, how did you not break down crying? I said, because I, unlike most of my talks, I, I read it like 20 times before I actually gave it in public. But I've been reading about her and discovering deeper about who she was. And so these questions and like, you know, why was mom here and she wasn't married, but her sisters were only here uh, after they were married. So I never understood that. I said, well, you know what happened? What? Uh, she led a protest at Bir Zaid University and got thrown into the back of an Israeli police vehicle and her dad said, I'm sending you to America with your sisters from now. So I said, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. So <laughs> she kept it, she, she, she had it strong from there. I grew up watching my father, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, uh, sit as a university professor on the opposite side of IDF generals and professors and things of that sort and completely wipe the floor with them in debate. And I was reading about my grandfather, my great-grandfather. Uh, and this is where the Turkish connection comes in. Mufti Munib Hashim, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, Mufti Munib Hashim is considered possibly the last Mufti of Palestine under the Ottoman Empire, Dawlul Uthmaniya. He was a Mufti in Nablus and I never met him, obviously. He is my mother's grandfather, so my great-grandfather. I was reading about him as much as I could. And mashallah, wrote many scholarly works and things of great prominence. I'm still trying to find my Turkish family because he moved to Turkey eventually. He got married in Turkey, so I've got some cousins in Turkey somewhere. Uh, but you know, that's not being caught by the, uh, the, the ancestry type websites. But um, SubhanAllah, one thing I read about him and I heard about him, and it's, it just shows you how something so symbolic can be so transformative and, and really captures the courage of the Palestinian people. I've never been able to enter Palestine before I actually got involved in activism. I was harassed at the border because of who my family was. And so I go to Jordan on an annual basis and I think about it. And inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to enter bidnillahi ta'ala as soon as I can. 
and I'll have my camera on, so if you see a Facebook Live go, go dark quickly, you know exactly what happened. Um, but I'm planning, inshallah ta'ala. But it encapsulates the courage of the Palestinian story and the people. And what I read about him was something very simple. He would never stand for the British. When the British would enter in, when the colonialists would come, the original colonialists, because Palestine is under a colonial project and we have to keep on reiterating that because that's being removed from fact, he would never stand up for them. And it would bother them and it would put him at great harm and he would be warned to stand for them and he would always refuse to stand up for them. And SubhanAllah, you think about where we are right now and the courage of the Palestinian people to simply stay home and exist. The courage of those families in Sheikh Jarrah to refuse to leave. You know, often, and I, I personally hate that the seerah of our beloved Prophet wasallam be weaponized for things that stand in complete contradiction to what he taught us. Hudaybiyah is weaponized against us. Those who choose to take a path of continuing to insist with what we have to resist this occupation. And in every way that we possibly can, that falls within the prophetic paradigm and the prophetic lens, ethical ways of resistance. And it said, well, why don't you just come back to the peace table? The same peace table, this imaginary peace table they've been talking about now for seven decades, the same two-state solution that has existed as some solution in the sky while one state continues to expand its occupation but the Prophet ﷺ used to compromise. The Prophet ﷺ used to sit at the table. And yes, we learn from the Prophet ﷺ moments of compromise, not on our deen, moments of compromise. We learn from the Prophet ﷺ moments of mercy and victory. We learn from the Prophet ﷺ steadfastness when you're persecuted. We learn everything from our Prophet ﷺ. But here's the thing about Hudaybiyah. The power in Mecca did not suddenly decide to enter into a treaty with the Muslims from Medina because they suddenly felt bad about the persecution. It was because the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims from Medina went towards Mecca and exposed the contradiction of the supposed claimed ideals of Mecca, which was that when people would come to make Umrah, they would not be persecuted. When they would come on their religious pilgrimage, they would not be persecuted that they would be allowed to do their pilgrimage. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Fine. We will expose your hypocrisy. We will expose your contradiction. He walked, which is very risky, with the best of his companions. And they were ready under Bay'atul Ridwan to die for their beliefs. They were ready to go into Mecca at whatever cost was going to be. These were a people that had cut up the bodies of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Mus'ab radiallahu anhu and others and the Prophet sallallahu and his people were willing to march forward. And so they punched the bully in the face until a bully was willing to compromise and come to a treaty that opened the doors of great things for the Muslims. And when the Prophet sallallahu was in power in Mecca, he didn't become like them and that was victory. He didn't become like them and that was victory. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us courage when you are supposedly powerless, courage when you are compromising, courage and principle when you are in a place of victory. He teaches us all of that ﷺ. And so I want to come to this question with the few minutes that I have. Because I get asked this question, and it's a question that comes up multiple times. Is Palestine a Muslim issue? Is Palestine a Muslim issue? Yes. That's your simple answer. Yes. But not only a Muslim issue. So let's unpack this a little bit. Palestine is a Muslim issue, but it's not only a Muslim issue. Because if you listen to our oppressors and their mouthpieces, what they try to do is they try to theologize, the theologize and wrap Palestine under all of this mystery, this thousands of years old conflict that we, 
we can't possibly start to get to the bottom of. And so what you're seeing of the bombing of children and what you're seeing of ethnic cleansing, legal terms, apartheid, in the, most, in the purest legal sense, you can't really call it that because it's wrapped under all of this mystery and you know how complicated religion gets. And so we got to theologize it because the average American or any person of any sincerity and dignity cannot sleep with themselves, seeing what they're seeing happening right now, being exposed through the likes of Mun al-Kurd and say, this is moral and we can support this. And so they wrap it under all of this theology and all of this religion and all of this complicated history. Why? So that they can make it the exception to any modern human rights discourse because it's a religious issue. What should be done when we say it's a religious issue is to put an exclamation mark on the human rights issue, not exceptionalize it from all other human rights discourse. To say that if in a land like this, that is so holy to Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and occupies such an important piece in history, if a land like this, in the 21st century, with the camera shining bright, can operate in such a fashion, then the whole world has failed its humanity. And so let me move it a little bit further. Is Palestine a Muslim issue? It's a Muslim issue, but it's not just a Muslim issue. People will say, well, you know, the Muslim vision for Palestine is one in which Jews do not exist, in which Christians do not exist, in which people are wiped out and oppressed. And I respond to them and I say, have you not read about Umar ibn Khattab anhu, entering into Palestine? That's my vision of Palestine, where Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is offered to pray in the church. And he says to the patriarch, let me walk out of here because if I pray here, then some overzealous Muslims will come later on and say, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu prayed here and they'll turn this into a masjid. And so out of his wisdom and sincerity, he walked out and he prayed in a place that is today Masjid Umar. My vision for Palestine is one that includes Ammu Fahd. <laughs> it doesn't exclude religious communities, doesn't wipe people out. My vision for Palestine is what Palestine was. It's not a false hypothetical situation in the future. It's one that existed with La ilaha, la ilaha illallah held high and people dignified as la ilaha illallah was held high. That's the vision that I want. And so don't come to me with your present reality of ethnically cleansing Palestinian Muslims and Christians and saying we have to do this because if we cede to these barbaric people, then they will wipe us off the planet. That's not true. And we have a history that is older than 70 years. Dear brothers and sisters, in conclusion, what I'd like to say here as you sit here and you are energized and you listen to people talk about policy and the vision of peaceful coexistence and justice and what that looks like. The narration of Maymuna radiallahu ta'ala anha was brought up about a religious obligation that if you can't go, put oil in the lamps. And I want you to realize that if it is an obligation of you that if you can't go, at least put some oil in the lamps, you better believe that it's also a religious obligation on you that you make sure that the lamps of the oppressors are not filled with oil that you purchase. That is part of your religion. That is part of your connection. That I have to be there in solidarity with Muna al-Kurd and those people in Sheikh Jarrah in any way that I possibly can. They're too young to have seen all of that. I respect them, I admire them, I love them, but I hurt for them. They show a lot of courage. And by the way, there's even courage in their tears. Because when you're trying to fight to keep your home, it's exhausting to have to expose that struggle to the world constantly. 
It's exhausting to have to explain over and over and over again why you're being kicked out of your home. Why you're being removed. And so we have to stand with them in every way that we possibly can. And that is a religious obligation. That is a human obligation. And you better charge any person that stands up and has the nerve to tell you that they're an ally against anti-Muslim bigotry at home, yet traffic in anti-Palestinian bigotry using the same tropes and mechanics of Islamophobia and say, we're your friends. No. You can't claim to love me here and hate me there. You can't claim to be against someone. I'm from Texas. Don't ask me why a bunch of Muslims settled in Dallas. I don't know. Uh, but we have people, white supremacist groups, that stand with AR-15s in front of our massages pretty regularly. You can't claim to be opposed to that, but before the desecration of one of the holiest masjids in Islam. You can't claim to be for my dignity and shed tears for the hatred that I face here at home in America, but then, had my parents not been kicked out of Palestine, I would have been one of the other dehumanized children that you're dehumanizing today. We can't accept that hypocrisy from the people that call themselves allies to the Palestinians. Demand more of your allies. Demand more of those people that claim to stand with you, and when they stand with you, stand with them. Because we understand the mechanics of dehumanization, and as I said in the khutbah, we have to charge ourselves to be more consistent. And so just as we are against the boots on the necks of our brothers and sisters in Palestine, we understand that they trained boots to be on the necks of our black brothers and sisters here in Chicago and in Dallas, Texas. And so consistency matters. May Allah make us consistent. May Allah keep us sincere. May Allah make us steadfast. May Allah free our beloved Palestine. May Allah restore Jerusalem to what we know it can be and allow us to pray two rak'ahs in a free Masjid al-Aqsa in our lifetimes. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Omar Sayman. I think we've all pretty much established that Palestine will be free. So I will just end it with a dua that my dear mother, Allah yafadha, and my father, Allah yirhamu, taught me, and it's my favorite dua. Allahumma sta'milna wa la tastabdilna. Ya Allah, use us and do not replace us. We know that you will bring justice to Palestine. You know that you will bring liberation to Palestine. Allow us, allow us to witness that liberation and allow it to happen on our hands. Ameen. <laughs>